Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you to the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy for this uh, very nice invitation to present the Center for Global Development report on the financial regulations for improving financial inclusion. Uh, before I start with the true content of it, let me tell you a little bit about how this report was produced. First of all, is the result of deliberations of a task force. It's a worldwide task force uh, formed by former governors of central banks from an, for a number of countries, as well as experts, both on financial regulation and financial inclusion, and academicians. We actually have India being represented in the report too. One of our task force members is Mr. Nachiket Moore, which I'm sure you all know very well. Uh, she's a member of the report and a very important contributor. Uh, the report was chaired by Stein Klassens, who works on the Fair Reserve Board in the United States, and myself. So I would like to uh, present the um, results uh, to you today. To do that, the first thing is, if I can make this work. So we know, and you all know, all of you interested in financial inclusion, know that there are so many obstacles for reaching the poor and the underserved population in terms of financial inclusion. But one of those constraints is regulation. And there are good regulation, those enabling the, the provision of financial services, and there is bad regulation, which is that that hampers the provision of financial services. So the basic purpose of this report is to improve financial inclusion, especially digital financial inclusion, because that's the way of the future, and I'm going to talk a little more about that, through a better regulatory framework. Now, why do we emphasize regulation and why the report is on regulation? You've seen many reports and many books and many uh, writings on financial inclusion, but it's difficult to find a report that focuses on regulation for financial inclusion. But why do we focus on regulation? Because basically for almost every activity that the financial sector undertakes, there is a regulation that governs the functioning of that provider in the delivery of that activity. And especially for digital financial products, there are many countries in the world that even for the provision of electronic money, there has to be a regulation that actually allows electronic money to be provided. So everything you look, regulation is there. So what the, our objective is, all right, if we want financial inclusion to be raised at the same level of other policy mandates that regulators have, we have to take and we, to talk with the same kind of language that regulators that have other mandates in the financial sector are used to. So the most important traditional mandates of financial regulators, is, it's not financial inclusion. The mandates are financial stability, financial integrity, and consumer protection. Those are the mandates of the regulators in the financial sector. Now I want to say, what if we want financial inclusion there too? Well, then I have to make compatible all of the mandates for this to be effective. So, to do that, in the report, we constructed the task force, constructed a very simple framework. The framework is based on principles that the regulators are very familiar with. And especially the first two, and I'm going to talk about them, regulators in the financial sector, by basically worldwide, doesn't have too much problems with them. So the first principle 
is regulated by functions. Similar regulations for similar functions. I'm going to name them first, but then through the use of examples, I'm going to show you exactly what I mean. So the first principle, as I say, is functionality. If two different providers are providing the same service, so the regulation in general should be quite similar. Second, regulation should be based on risk. And actually in my talk, the emphasis is going to be that the first two have to come together. You cannot do functions only and risk separately. They have to be combined. And the third principle is to find the right balance between what is known as ex-ante and exposed regulation. What is ex-ante regulation? It is when the rules are set. So if I tell you that these are the conditions under which you are going to operate, that's called ex-ante. If I reserve the right to intervene later on because I see the emergence or the eruption of abuses, that's exposed regulation. So this balancing between ex-ante and exposed regulation are going to, uh, I'm going to make them very clear to you once I go through the presentation and use examples. Okay, those three basic principles that I'm going to be using throughout are basically used for advancing recommendation on three areas. Competition policies, leveling the playing field between providers, and regulations about know your customer. So let me start with competition policies. Okay, it is clear, and I think it's almost obvious, that for the sake of financial inclusion, especially in developing countries, a good competition policy matters a lot. Because only markets that are open to competition will actually have an incentive to include consumers that are not being served. And the reason is because when you have a monopolistic position, that dominant player is going to focus on serving a very small part of the population, those that basically are riskless, that have the better collateral, and so there's really no incentive for the provision of financial services. If you open to competition, if there are more players, then the search for making profits is going to generate incentives to actually develop new services for different type of peoples, including poor people. So the goal of the recommendations that deal with competition policies is to encourage the entry of new but qualified, look how qualified is in bold letters, is on purpose, qualified providers of financial services, but at the same time without hampering the collaboration that could emerge between players. So why don't I give you an example so that we understand exactly what I mean. In, in, in the area of financial inclusion, it's very common to talk about interoperability, especially when we're talking about financial services. What is interoperability? Basically the ability of networks to communicate. Forget for a second about financial inclusion. Just think about you going to a bank and trying to um, uh, get money from an ATM machine. If the bank that you are using does not interoperate, interact with the network from another bank, you will always have to go to the ATM from the same bank. There has to be communication between the networks so that you as a user can actually take benefit of the whole financial provision of services. So why is this so relevant for financial inclusion? Because when we are talking about digital financial services, then 
A very common usage is the usage of the cell phone. And cell phones are provided by mobile network operators and mobile networks, the use networks is there um, uh, for a reason, have to be able to interconnect between themselves. If when you make a transfer from one network, somebody else that has the service with another network can actually receive the transfer. The question is, imagine a country where a mobile network operator starts the business of providing financial services. And there is no market, really. There, the, the provider comes and wants to offer the service, but how is going to convince the people to use the service or not? So there is no incentive there to make his network or its network available to other companies. There is a gain in actually keeping agents that serve you under your network. So the question for regulators is, should interoperability, again, this interconnectivity between networks, be mandated? Should, since the very beginning, regulators come and say, OK, if you are going to provide financial services, through the, through the uses of a cell phone, um, and there is another company. Should their networks be talking to each other? Should they, should they be interoperable? And the answer and the recommendation is no. We believe that interoperability should be encouraged, and all efforts should be made so that it actually emerge as a market solution. And only, and only in the last stage, when actually there, it is not coming in spite of all the best efforts of the regulators, only then it should be mandated. If you look at that type of tree that is in the uh, 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 PowerPoint, in the transparency, see how it works, OK? Um, ideally, interoperability is going to emerge spontaneously, ideally. That's in an ideal world. You have two networks, three, four networks, and they cooperate. You make a transfer from one, and there's no problem what, what company you are linked to. The, any mobile network operator will connect to each other. And again, this is not only for mobile network operators. It's for ATMs, for banks, for any uh, agent that is in the provision of financial services. So if it emerges spontaneously, well, we're OK. Now. If it does not, what is there to do? Well, the first thing to do is not to mandate it, but to deal with the market distortions that actually are preventing this, the interoperability to emerge. And most likely is a dominant player that doesn't want to give the right of his, uh, of his uh, um, sharing his, his network. So. We should work at that point as regulators, then we should work more in terms of antitrust rules, in terms of preventing the advance of that monopoly power, but not at the very beginning cut it off and say, OK, you have to be interoperable. Why? Because, again, since these markets are new, at the beginning, the, the regulator needs to allow some rents to be actually taken by the newcomers into the game. It's a new game. It has to be needed, allowed to develop. Once the market has developed, then yes, of course, there is need for intervention. But before that, no. So suppose that you actually are trying to prevent the entrenchment of monopoly powers. So does, does interoperability emerge spontaneously now? Perhaps yes, and that's great, but perhaps no. At this stage is when you should ask yourself, should I now mandate it? And that's what we call exposed regulation, because you have allowed ex ante for the system to develop, to work, but now exposed you are going to intervene to mandate uh, interoperability. But again, 
the question, and I this I have to repeat over and over again, the issue here is timing. If there is no more cost, if it's clear that this is the time, the right time to um, mandate it, that's fine. But be careful because you could be intervening too early or too late. Too late is if you waited so long that the inefficiencies and the entrenched monopoly powers are so strong that, well, my goodness, now really you have to make so many changes into the system. But too early if, if the actual innovation, investment, and development of market have not happened yet. So that, that is kind of a tricky issue, uh, but very important. Has this happened in the world, and how has it been tackled? The answer is yes. Actually, in different countries, but here I have two examples for countries in Africa. And there are very interesting two examples. One is Tanzania, and the other is Kenya. In Tanzania, interoperability actually emerged as a market solution. It did emerge. Uh, there were a number of players, uh, mobile network operators, um, Airtel, uh, Tigo, and Santel were in the market, and the big player there was Vodacom. Okay? These are mobile network operators. Now, the regulator basically stated its preference of not mandating it of interoperability, of not intervening directly into the functioning of the market. So what happened is that the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, that is a, um, a partner of the, a part of the World Bank Group, basically facilitated the interaction, the conversation, the discussion between the players. It acted as an honest broker without the government at all. And it was through that mediator of pros and cons that all the providers agreed to cooperate and all the system is interoperable now. Okay, so it is, actually has happened. Now, in Kenya, that's not the situation. Safaricom is the largest player. And right now, there is no interoperability between the, the players in, in Kenya. There is no full interoperability. However, as you know, there are different levels. Like you have the company level, of course, the whole network level, but then you have the agents who actually are the ones that provide uh, is the interface with the customer and charges the cell phone. Okay. There was no interoperability at all and, um, in Kenya between the agents. In other words, one agent will serve Safaricom only, say. If somebody else comes and say, well, no, I really want to work with another company, you will have to go to a different agent. And that different agent could be very far away, okay? So Safaricom was keeping its network of agents to itself. So to the extent, and I have a number there, that 96% of agents were serving, by in 2014, only one provider exclusively. So there was exclusivity by agents. Well, in July 2014, the competition authority in Kenya basically made an announcement. They did not mandate it. They just said that they were going to mandate interoperability between agents. They were going to. The moment that announcement was made, Safaricom opened up its network. So it was induced, okay? It was not a rule. It was the announcement that that was going to happen. And that announcement actually was what was needed to open Safaricom's network, which is the dominant player. So these are real examples in the world that actually are happening. What about leveling the playing field? 
people always ask me what is the most important difference between the recommendations in competition policies and the recommendations in level the playing field. Well, for clarification, just let me tell you that competition policies basically deal with the behavior of agents. I was talking about how um, one major player, one dominant player, about the behavior of agents. I was talking about agents and, and, um, and players. When I talk about level the playing field, I'm talking about the role of regulators directly. What is level in the playing field? It's basically treating providers as fair as possible. You level the playing field. And why is so important for financial inclusion, especially, especially digital financial inclusion? Because the providers of digital financial services are multiple, right? They are banks, they are cooperatives, they, they are um, uh, uh, mobile network providers. Western Union is a provider of financial service through transfers of remittances. Uh, so the players are multiple, and at the same time, they are uh, regulated by a large number of regulators from the central bank to the competition authority to the um, uh, telecommunications authority. So how do you deal with multiple players and multiple regulation, regulators? You could be in a situation where even inadvertently, because every regulator is focusing in its own mandate, is going to be regulating the function very differently than from another regulator that is serving another provider. For example, if the mobile network operator <laughs> is controlled or is supervised only by the um, telecommunications authority, then the rules are going to be very different than those that are given to banks by the central bank. So the goal of the recommendations that I'm presenting to you today is to prevent that regulations create distortions that favor one type of providers versus another type of providers. So this is basically to ensure that functional equivalent digital services are regulated equally. Now, here's an example from another country of how you can have an unleveled playing field. And this is the example of Indonesia. Okay, in Indonesia, the penetration of government to payment services is very large. And the usage of mobile money is also very large. However, in spite of that, only 36% of Indonesian adults have an account at the formal financial institution. So you have the ingredients, but you don't have the results. Why is this happening? Well, you know, again, in terms of agents, it just happened that the regulator in Indonesia only allows mom and pop shops, the small, little, little retailers, to deal with large banks. If you are a small bank, you're not allowed to deal with these mom and pop shops, with the small retailers. So, of course, there are many banks as well as mobile network providers that have networks in, uh, in uh, rural areas, in far away, uh, far away areas, that could actually benefit from actually dealing with mom and pops as agents, I'm talking just as agents, but the regulation does not allow for it. So just by that, you are unleveling the playing field. You are giving an advantage to large banks versus small banks, not because of stability, not because of any concern, but because you think that, okay, large banks may have better information about mom and pops, which I really don't understand why, and this is from our perspective, not a good regulation. 
Now, I need to make this very clear. Because understanding the level playing field is not as easy as it appears. And it could lead to actually um, faulty regulation. It is true that the functional approach, that's the way it's called, basically means equal treatment for function, functionally similar services. So what you have in that graph is you have several providers, provider one, provider two, provider X, and then different services. And the red lines, the red circles, basically means that regardless of who's the provider, as long as it's offering the, the same service, the regulation should be same, the same for that service. But having said that, I have a very, very important comment. And this is that subject to the level of risk. In other words, the same service provided that the risk is the same. And let me give you an example, actually using the Indian experience. Imagine the provision of a store of value service, which is backed by safe assets. A store of value service. What is a store of value service? Well, basically, it could be a deposit in a bank. Or the example that I'm going to use right now, what about the, a deposit offered by a payment bank? They are not in function yet, but that's what INDA is looking for. Basically, the idea of a payment bank is that the population can open a small account deposits, they're limited, but the bank cannot, the payment bank cannot offer loans. The, these little deposits are backed by totally safe assets. In the balance sheet of the payment bank, it's a very simple balance sheet. On the liability side, it has the deposits, the accounts open by the population. And on the asset side, it only has government bonds or very liquid assets, safe assets, okay? So this is a store of value backed by safe assets. So, the regulation, whatever that is, and we all know about the regulation, but that regulation is proportionate to the risk. And the risk here is very small. Why is very small? Because obviously the payment banks, by having only safe assets, by definition, the assets are safe, and so if there is a problem, those assets will be used to pay the depositors. So, the regulation should be simple and not very burdensome because the risk is not very large, okay? Now, imagine now that to the, in the, to the right hand side, I have a similar store of value service, but this is not backed by safe assets. Okay, what is the best example of this instrument? is a typical bank deposit. In a typical bank, bank deposit, the liability is still a deposit, just as in the payment bank. But the assets of a bank are not just safe assets, they are loans, and loans are risky assets. And so what has happened is that I have the same store of value service, but the risk of the provider is larger. And so I will have a problem if I keep the same regulation because the risk has increased. And so by increasing the risk, basically I would have unleveled the playing field. What I have to do if the provider involves more risk is to increase the amount of regulation to level the playing field again. So, why 
have I taken time to explain this? Because remember the example I've given. I've given the example of one instrument that is the same, a deposit, a store of value called deposit. If somebody comes to me and say, I have a deposit, so the regulation on this deposit, you have, you have told that the, the, for a given service, the regulation should be the same. So to, to satisfy the regulation by function. So if I come with a deposit, people could be very confused because they say, okay, it's a deposit, so the regulation should be exactly the same. Only if the risk is the same. Because if that deposit is offered by a payment bank, it is a very different risk than if that same deposit is offered by a universal bank. That's why for financial inclusion, it's not only uh, same regulation for same service. It's same regulation for the same service provided that the risk is also the same, okay? That is perhaps one of the most important contributions of this report. It combines the two things. Otherwise, people can make a lot of mistakes in the regulatory area, okay, if you forget risk. So once we think in that direction, then regulate, how to regulate becomes the framework of how to regulate becomes much easier. For example, I'm not going to go into all the details there, I just want to transmit the concept. Um, what is the less risky product in the financial sector world? It's payments, just payments. Not the store of value. I'm not talking now about uh, a deposit in a payment bank. It's just payments. When you go to Western Union to make a transfer, okay, what is the risk? You basically give your money, but you are not storing your money there, right? Your money is supposed to almost instantly be transferred to another recipient. So it's only the intraday risk, you know, the time between you send the money and the time between the person who received the transfer actually received the money. That is the only time, a very limited time, in which there is risk. So payments are the riskless of all financial services, payments. Therefore, the regulation should be the lightest for the provision of these type of services. You move a little bit higher, and now we are talking about a store of value, deposit, backed by full assets, by, by safe assets, sorry, by safe assets, and that is the case of the payment banks in India. But if you keep moving up and you start offering a store of values that are not fully backed by a store of assets, then you have more risk, and therefore the regulation should be even stronger. And finally, in that scale of risk and regulation, you get to the provision of credit services. Credit is the riskier activity in the whole provision of services. Why? It involves leverage. It involves the capacity of using a certain amount of money to create secure, not securities, but to create assets of a much larger amount. And because leverage is riskier, the burden of regulation should be much greater too. Finally, let me move to know your customer regulations. Why this is so important? Well, know your customer rules can definitely have positive and negative effects on financial inclusion. On the positive side, clearly, a provider needs to know their customers, right? And the more uh, the provider knows their customers, the more willing is going to be to offer a large variety of financial services. At the same time, we can have situations where there is excessive regulations on know your customers, and that could hinder financial inclusion. Let me explain this. 
I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, recent um, events in the world regarding what is called de-risking. I live in the United States, and to me it's kind of not surprising because I know about this, but it always calls my attention when I receive almost every month a note from my bank that says, from now on, starting, say, June 1st, uh, this bank is no longer uh, make transfers or provide transfer services to bank X in country Y. Two months pass by and I receive another note saying, this bank is no longer going to provide transfer service to another bank from another country. That's called de-risking. Why is called the risking? Because the reason why banks are doing that is because the regulations of know your customers are really stringent these days. The idea behind know your customer is a good idea. You want to fight against money laundering and terrorism finance. So it's a good cause. The problem is that there is no clear definition about what are the penalties that are going to be imposed to you if actually this is a violation of your customers. It's not clear. And most importantly, we're humans. It's almost impossible to expect that there is going to be forever zero money laundering in the world. So zero tolerance for money laundering doesn't work. There's always going to be thief, fraud, it's always going to exist. However, can you imagine any government that is going to come and say, okay, I will accept a little bit of money laundering? That's impossible. No politician is going to come and say, oh, I'm comfortable with a little bit of money laundering. No, nobody is going to make that statement. In the meantime, because of that, because the idea is zero tolerance and not very clear what is going to happen to you, bank, if actually through your bank some money laundering or financing of terror is happening because the rules are not clear, the banks say, okay, okay, I am going to assume the worst. I'm going to assume that if something happened, I'm going to be penalized quite severely. So what do I do? I simply do not serve the riskier customers. And who are the riskier customers? They're always the poor. There is one case that called huge attention in the world, and it's the case of Somalia. Basically, Somalia was excluded to receive transfers from the rest of the world. I mean, that means that all Somalis are going to be involved in money laundering. No, it's not that. It's that the banks basically, given the rules at the international level, decided to de-risk. So we are facing this problem. If the, the goal is good, I mean, you are trying to prevent money laundering and financing of terrorism. But if you go and make them the rule absolutely too harsh, financial inclusion is going to suffer. The poorest populations are the ones that are going to suffer. So what can be done? The first thing is that there are two goals. You want to have financial integrity. This financial uh, fight against money laundering and terrorist financing is called financial, the fight for financial integrity. The system is supposed to have integrity. At the same time, you want financial inclusion. At the worldwide level, at the level of the standard setting bodies, of the multilateral organizations, it is recognized now that you need to follow what is called a risk-based approach. So if it's little risk, then the regulations on know your customer should not be that harsh. 
Okay, that is what is being said, but again, it's not clear. So really the most important solution or direction towards a solution to this problem comes from a strong national identification. And again, this is not done on purpose, but it just happened to be that India is a great example of the right way to go through the Aadhaar system. Because only biometrics can really work, okay? You basically don't have to prove anything. You are you because you are allocating through biometrics a given, a given number that identifies you and only you. It's like your DNA the equivalent, right? And in India, one new method is being tried that I like very much, which is that rather than saying, okay, you prove that you are you, meaning not your customer, and then you can open a bank account, India is allowing to open a bank account first and then give some time and say, okay, in I think it's up to a year or something like that, you have to show proof of other heart. So it's using the, the uh, proof of identity as, as a result, as an encouragement. And why is this so important? Because the moment the person has the other heart, then it's actually not only complying with the regulation of know your customer because it's identified, but also because that person is, becomes actually a subject of receiving a large variety of financial services. So biometric really is going to be the way to go. Now, let me tell you something very interesting. Extremely few countries in the world have a strong national identification system. The United States doesn't have one. And most countries in the world don't have one, even less through biometrics. This is new. It's really groundbreaking. And I think the only way that this problem, this conflict of know your customer and financial inclusion is going to be solved. It's the only way. Again, it's technology. Technology is coming our way in many directions for the purpose of financial inclusion. Financial inclusion problems are going to be solved if technology is allowed to work in the context of good regulations. The reason why we have this report is because of the fear that regulations could actually don't let or may become an impediment for technology to actually support financial inclusion. But there are more examples of what else you can do in terms of know your customer. And I have two more examples and with this I'll, I'll um, finish the first part of this discussion, and it's basic accounts. And again, basic accounts for low-income customers is used in India. I mean, originally I'm from Peru, South America, far away from here. And India and Peru are two of the countries that actually used these restricted accounts which basically implies that you need to show very little to actually be able to open an account. Peru is another country in the world that has not as good as Adahar, but has a good um, identification system. It's not bad at all, relatively speaking. It still has a long way to go, but it's not bad. And so these basic accounts are allowing to um, open accounts is at small numbers for people with not much income, but at the same time with little risk because the account is so small. And finally, there is one suggestion that we believe is a great suggestion. Everybody likes this suggestion, but it has not been implemented anywhere. And it's graduated penalties. Remember that I told you that there is no clear definition about what the penalties are, and so people expect the worst. Well, in our view, penalties 
should not be based on failure to comply with Know Your Customer, but in, on failure to comply with due diligence. Let me explain. If I tell a bank or a financial institution, I'm the regulator and I tell the bank, okay, this is what you have to do in terms of due diligence for knowing your customer. Okay, you have to do A, B, and C. And the bank does it, and does it, and always does it. And suddenly, a person with a small account, this is a recommendation for financial inclusion, so we are talking about small account. Person for a small account is discovered to be involved in money laundering. What do I do? Do I go after that bank and close the bank and whatever? Our recommendation is no. No. The bank has followed its due diligence to the last line. This is fraud. This is ingenuity. This is human nature. Now, if that bank becomes known as the bank through which people can actually uh, be inventive, then of course you uh, increment the size of the penalty. But that's what is called graduated penalties. I tell you what you're supposed to do. If you do it right, I'm going to allow for mistakes. I'm not going after you completely. I'm going to, of course, I'm going not to be happy about it as regulator. I'm going to call your attention. I'm going, but I'm going to give you more chances to operate. And so, the, if, again, if you start repeating uh, the, the, the problem, then the penalties increase. If the violations start getting larger in terms of the amounts involved, then the penalties increase. But I cannot be a bank that suddenly finds somebody in their accounts that is going wrongdoing with the money, and then the bank is subject to a huge penalty at the same level of a large bank that is um, um, uh, involved with huge amount of money in, in money laundering. That recommendation is just common sense, but it's not being implemented anywhere yet. And the question really is why? And I think that the answer is only it will happen. We, we, the only thing we need is a champion. He is a strong regulator from a strong country in the world that actually go ahead and does it. That's all. Many, many times with this kind of difficult things where actually political issues are involved, what you need is a strong regulator. And that is just a question of time. All right, let me stop here. Thank you.